Welcome to the Builders Podcast, episode 153, Alexander de Ritter, AI Agents Unleashed, How Businesses Must Adapt or Fall Behind. Before we jump into this episode, please subscribe to this podcast, hit that notification bell if you're on YouTube, and after a listen, please give us a thumbs up, like, and share if we've earned it. With your help, we can reach more people and deliver these valuable from the trenches lessons to those that need it. Enjoy the episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another The Builders. Today, we are joined by Alexander De Ritter. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Matt. So, Alex, Xander, <laughs> I want to call you Alex. Can I call you Alex? Do I, does anybody call you Alex? Or you oh, just well, Alexander. I like to be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Alexander, okay. So, Alexander is the co founder of Smith OS, right? I say that right? Well, I'm, I'm just struggling to sit today. Um, <laughs> we, he wants to call himself maybe the CTO, but he's the AI guy. He's an AI expert and building AI things. And it's one of my favorite topics. If you've been on this podcast for a while, we've talked about it a few times. And um, I'm always kind of keeping track of AI. And um, even in my own business, um, being a business owner, uh, trying to figure out how to integrate it and use it uh, daily. Uh, especially in web development, design, and that those arenas. Um, so we're gonna uh, we're talk a lot about AI today, and and uh, his thoughts about uh, what's going on today, and also uh, what he does. Um, so, but before we do that, the first time we have somebody on the show, we like to dig into your story a little bit, Alexander, and uh, your origin story. What created you? Who influenced you? How you got here? How you? got to this place where you're this awesome person helping people in the world. Uh, so with that, I'm going to first give it to you and, and you can tell the short version, long version, whatever you feel like today. Um, spider bite, freak <laughs> accident. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. <laughs> um, yeah. A long, long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, away. Yes. <laughs> um, I was um, I was born in a beautiful village of Bruges in Belgium, and um, I grew up there. Fantastic childhood. Um, you could bike from one side of town to the other side in just fifteen minutes with your bicycle. Nice. Yeah. Um, yet, in that small piece of land there was there was imprinted on it over 800 years of history you could go to the center of town and go to the city hall and you could see the mayoral records of what they decided when they had their weekly or monthly meeting nope from 800 years ago yeah wow. it's all preserved wow. you could get married in a city hall that was built probably five six hundred years ago you could still see the statues of all of the um, local stewards and lords from all the villages that were under the protectorate of the town Bruges where Bruges served as the central you know government so to speak it was a very cooperative time with city-states and city-states grouping together under the protection of a larger more influential wealthier town for additional protection mm. they had very innovative forms of government which we could learn a thing or two from for example in the middle of the city there was a large tower called the Belfort overlooking the market square and people famously go walk up those stairs all the way to the top and on a clear day you can see over the North Sea Channel the shores of England Wow! Um, when I left for America I uh, climbed those stairs and uh, I was like Simba this is your <laughs> land <laughs> um, but about 
about one third up the tower, there's a there's a treasure chest, and that treasure chest famously has seven locks. And each of the guilds of town um, were represented in city government, and they all had a key. And so the city chest would not be opened until all seven guilds were in unanimous agreement. Imagine running a country like that. Dang, yeah. But this is key. This is key to the wealth of the medieval town. Now, I grew up there, um, and because the lack of cars uh, and prominence of bicycles, um, I was a free-roaming chicken since, like, age five, six, seven. I could go to school by myself. Later, I got my bike. Whether it would be raining or snowing uh, or sunshine, I would be on my bicycle. I would go from school to the library, to my grandmother, to my parents, to my uncles, and the whole town... Um, the whole town was mine. Sometimes I had a day off from school. I could take my bicycle to um, to the seaside, which was which was you know by car it would be twenty minutes away. So you could imagine by bike you know a few hours. Mm -hmm. um, and they had these beautiful canals uh, lined with 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 trees and fresh air, and you could just like lose yourself in the beauty of the nature there. Uh, it was a wonderful time to grow up. I spent most of my uh, my time out of school. I would spend it in, either in the library or um, with my uncle building computers or then later at home uh, on my computer. I started programming at 13 uh, with Turbo Pascal. Started object-oriented programming at 16 with evening classes. I was in a in a class with a group of forty year olds. It was a sixteen year old at that time. <laughs> what, what year was you know, this? this what, was what year are we talking? Like when you were ninety seven. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Th no, thirteen would be thirteen. I was not in a class with adults, but it was would be ninety four because okay. I'm from eighty one. Gotcha. Gotcha. And um, okay. then you know, closer to two thousand, I was in university in Ghent, which is uh, the historical rival town of Bruges, and. Um, the education in Belgium is extremely rigorous, extremely academic. It's not so hands-on, it's not so practical. There's no multiple choices, I assure you. Um, in fact, for ADHD people like myself, it's pure torture because they want you to remember and like entire novels of facts and they grade a lot based on that. That got better in university, but they still heavily rewarded uh, for memory function, uh, not, not not creativity, for sure. It was more about regurgitation, and this is this is part of the culture that formed me, that made me very technical, very capable, mm -hmm. uh, but honestly challenged my weaknesses. And my strengths come from creativity. It really does. My my parents are. Um, my parents are hairstylists, they, but not just any hairstylist. My dad was on the world's top stages all around the world uh, performing. He trained the American team who won the gold medal for hair competition. Wow. He, he was champion in Belgium. He's been artistic director of Entrecoiffure for all Europe. He's done all runways. He's, his creation's been on all magazines. My grandmother started that business. She was the first. Um, she was the first female in Belgium, who was, um, at least, is how I was told, um, who was married to a government employee, who started her own business, and at that time, government employees made so much money they could like retire at forty in luxury. <laughs> <laughs> they made so much money back then uh, that was unthinkable for a woman. So. Yeah. My grandfather was in Brussels, uh, hours away from home, when my grandmother was raising four sons and running a business by herself. Um, but m my family's very gifted artistically and, and creatively, um, but also very, uh, on my mother's side, very much into business. Um, my mother's side, they lived on the border with France, and um, they would take their traveling... Um, cart and horse 
later on um, a Citroën van uh, and um, they would load it up with merchandise from Flanders and they would go into all the little towns in France uh, trading, going to marketplaces uh, that was a lot of linen a, a lot of chairs now that that sells stuff I can I see it you know even like uh, my dad in the hair salon he would always sell the most hair products <laughs> um, but then when I was in college I, in the summer breaks I would go and they call it pr promotion boys they call them in Belgium they would be like an agency who just deploys like young people trained them on their product and deploy them to an event like Franco Chan Formula One, we would we would go there, and we would go work for Citibank and convince all those people in that lobby to sign up for a Citibank card, or we would go to a, a trade show and we would represent some product and hand out flyers and persuade people to sign up their name for a list or something like mm. that. <clears throat> um, we would consistently be like the the top performers in Belgium. Uh, then later on. Um, my brother, the same thing. He was into doing solar panels at some point for his summer job or whatnot. He was also like top performer in Belgium. His company sent him to, I don't know, Atlantis World and wherever ocean island um, all the time. Like so, and my, my background, you know, fascinated with technology and computers. Um, how did you, how did you get, how did you get there? Like, but so you're yeah. you're growing up and stuff. You said you were, had computers and stuff. Who was getting you the computers? You don't just buy go out and buy a computer at thirteen. And all my because yeah, for me so, I, it was very similar for me. First of all, I I ran around in yeah. bikes too. I was kind of a little bit smaller town, so I I, I love that. Um, but also, um, you know, my dad was kind of a nerd as well, and he we always had a computer in our house in the eighties. I go a little further back than you. Um, so Apple II, Apple II GS, and, and all that. No, no computers at my house. Um, my uncle was on full disability. Okay. Um, he had, um, he started as a hairstylist, worked in the family business, but then developed a, a, a very rare disease um, that affected his back where he would start growing, mm. like curved over, mm -hmm. and he got full disability. Um, and... Um, and and as he had full disability, he had a ton of time on his hands. And, um, you know, he would do little knickknacks here and there for, like, for people. And and I don't know what, what his origin story is. Mm. I just know, as a young boy, um, he would be building computers uh, for people. And he would go to the computer store, buy the parts, put them together... And make a little money on the side. Mm -hmm. It was not nothing substantial to live from, but it was something he was really passionate right, about. Right. And so he helped a lot of people. I mean, I mean, it, I guess it's long, t long ago, uh, and it's okay now. But you know, there was a time there was no internet, <laughs> and people were still having wares, <laughs> and people were still having cracked versions of apps. Yeah, and there was an entire. I mean, you could think of it like drug trade with smuggling and everything. There was an entire network of people copying stuff on floppy disks and later CD, uh, CD-ROMs and and shipping them all over. Uh, I remember like his supplier and whatnot came from the Netherlands, and it was more like um, it was more like a uh, every month he would be like a collector and he would collect. A series of apps or games I never even heard of. You couldn't buy them if you wanted to. No kidding. There was no internet. Yeah. The stores didn't have it, whatnot, and it would include a few games, a few productivity apps. I mean, we're talking about really crappy interfaces. You're talking about, you know, MS DOS yeah, yeah. or Windows 3.1 and 2. Um, and we would, you know, we'd load those discs and it, or or and later CDs, and they would just be spinning forever to just load <laughs> one thing. But then when you had it, it was like it was like having the internet but on discs. And every month there was like a curation of something that you would, that, yeah, that you would just be amazed at like what people came up with now. Not, but I wasn't much into that at at that age for sure. Um, I was, 
I was after school. I was just taking my bike, would go to his house, and I'd watch him build computers. That's so cool. You know, and yeah. then, then I was able to put a piece of RAM in, yeah. and then I was able to help him configure BIOS and, and, and see how that worked. And so we built, we built, we built, and soon soon enough, um, I, I was... I was, I guess, gifted or my dad bought or my uncle gifted. I don't, honestly, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I just know it was a 386 that was my first computer. And, um, you know, I I was already programming in BASIC and then Pascal. And, you know, I, I distinctly remember there was a time that I operated my computer without Windows 3.1. Um, it was only DOS for a while. Yeah. And my user interface was an app called Glance. And it was just amazing that I had this thing called a mouse that I could move and work with because, you know, MS DOS was just text yeah, interface. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I know America was a little bit more sophisticated already at the time. There were already Macs floating around as well and, and more advanced, advanced user interfaces. Yeah, I suppose it's not. But no, not in Belgium. Yeah. yeah, but the thing that eventually made me move stateside and this is part of like what what the story i was telling and why i was telling mm -hmm. it um the education system is very academic and rigorous which addresses my weaknesses but then my strengths are um i'm extremely curious creative and i'm pretty good at you know sales as well and marketing things like that so like this intersection of computer creativity and humans like that's kind of this weird spot i occupy yeah. I get this a lot that when um, I talk about technology, they say like, many people who know this much about technology uh, can't communicate what they built as well. So uh, then I, I know, like I know for sure, like in school and university, I was not the best student, but graded by what metric, you know, um, life success later, ability to turn technology into useful solutions, mm -hmm. ability to communicate the value and, 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 and find value. Um, these are, um, you know, these are different ways you can measure a student's Absolutely. success, yeah. right? And, but if ultimately, I felt that every single thing in, in my education, in my upbringing, in school, everything was geared towards making you follow the path and be a very good employee for someone or some right, company. Right. It was not encouraging you to break rules, think out of the box, pursue your own adventure. Uh, my, my family always stayed in the same geographical region, but my mom's parents were always traveling from town to town as well. So there's this there's this drive to go and explore the world. There's this drive to go and take your craft around the world. There's this drive to be creative. There's this there's this drive to, you know, be like my dad and, um, and you know, stand on the world's top stages. Right. But his mount his Mount Everest was in hair industry. So I wanted to find my own mountain to climb, uh, because if if your dad reaches the top then there's no excitement there. Um, you know, what I, I had, they say like, uh, I had the hands to be in, in his footsteps yeah. and be famous in the hair industry. Yeah. I had the empire to inherit, so to speak. Right, right. I grew up in, in his hair salon with like, you know, 12 hairdresser employees walking around. But I wasn't the prince. I was the, I was the uh, hair sweeper. <laughs> the hair sweeper. <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, but I watched him running business and yeah. deal with people yeah. and you know hairstylists are psychologists they're psychologists everybody comes and tells your does their problem True. they're sitting down they're you hear everything you know about their upcoming divorce before the husband knows it right it's yeah. as a it's like a privileged position yeah. it's like a therapist and so I had impressions of you know entrepreneurship how to run a business how to treat your people um how to deal with people's problems um so my intersection i'd like the thing that i like uniquely occupy is really an intersection of technology and humanity uh has always been at the core of what i did but yeah it was not big enough for me, my playground. I needed to have a place where I could 
be think very different do very do things my own way kind of like <laughs> frank sinatra says right i did it my way yeah. um not in everything you know i think tradition is very very important very important but when it comes to your creative expression and work you have to be able to break boundaries you ha otherwise everything stays the same and we need to keep advancing as a society yeah so i was the first of my my own nuclear family to move to the united states mm -hmm. i had my my mom's my mom's brother had moved to the united states when i was a little boy and you know and then i had an, an a, f a dear friend from my dad was a who was a you know partner student whatnot my dad was training them in hair and uh, they they would keep keep visiting from America so as I was growing up I would get a little I would get I got my first Game Boy my dad was against games and stuff so they brought it from America they brought me Disney uh, tape cassettes that I could play and repeat and sing along so I'm a sucker for Disney karaoke as well <laughs> nice. and it planted <laughs> seeds in my in my mind yeah. about like coming to America from a young age. Huh. So when I came to the United States, I you know I was already educated at that time. Started as a developer. Two thousand eight started in machine learning. Wow. And then two thousand, uh, and then from two thousand eight to two thousand fifteen, um, I I was self-employed and independent contractor, and then um. And then starting 2015-16, incorporated with my business partners. Um, my first businesses, I've I've already built and sold two agencies by now, and I'm currently running an AI, um, an AI software company, uh, which is not yet exited from. We have a lot of growth left in front of us. Yeah, you're still having fun. So <laughs> it's a little longer story. No, I love it. But these are things that nobody will will ever hear or know unless I like share it. And so I thought it would be it would just be neat to kind of, kind of get a glimpse into what the world looked like in being a kid growing up in a beautiful medieval town in the nineties. Well, I'm gonna tell you, I you know that's why I love stories and I love starting here. Because we all have different origin stories, you know, all come from different places, but we can learn a lot, not only about you, but, you know, other places. Like, I'm thinking about what, where, how you grew up and where you grew up and the history there and all that stuff. And as a, an American who's been living in the center of Wisconsin, well, I grew up in the center of Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah. We yeah, we don't have as much to talk about in that regard, you know. It's we haven't been around. I'll tell that you long. one more thing, Matt. <laughs> on my on my mom's side of the family, there is a in that town. There is a there is a church, and next to that church, there's a graveyard. And in that graveyard, I can see like seven generations of ancestry yeah. buried in that one place. Yeah. Incredible. So uh, we can't we, we can't even appreciate that here. I mean, we're you know a few yeah. hundred years. I mean, we I think we started doing things around I don't know five hundred years ago or something. Um, but um, yeah, and, and so that. But then you know just how you grew up. I lo I loved hearing that you know about running around in a bike and stuff. Like I you know that's something I can relate to because I came from a semi small town. We had like fifteen thousand people. Um, at in where I grew yeah. up, grew up sounds about right. Yeah. And so I could drive across town, you know, and, and go to school on my bike and run around. That's how we got around. And it's, it's you just didn't pass like a, like four or five architectural epochs. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we're yeah, we're not quite. Yeah. Yeah. But but that's amazing. And I, and I also and I and then you were talking about, you know, how your family and and, and um, were into entrepreneurship and what they all did with their lives and and hair mm -hmm. and um and the lessons you learn there you know being around those environments is because osmosis I, yeah i mean it's it's that and what what stands out to me and, and hearing talking to a lot of people in business and stuff um in my regular business and podcast and everything is that so many things translate 
um, to other things. Like there's so many lessons you can learn and take from that business and apply it to mm -hmm. what you're doing in AI, right? Now you're talking about, I don't know how you put it, um, where it's kind of tech and people or something. I don't know what you said. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but I, I think that's amazing. So a lot, that, and Matt, that makes you unique. All those experiences makes you unique right. in the world and you can kind of carve out your own. That's another thing. Like I feel like I, you know, a lot of us, maybe it's an entrepreneurial thing. We want to carve out our own legacy, our own, uh, you know. It's, it's also, it's also one, one source of diversity, right? A very radically different life and experience growing up than most everyone I meet here in the United yeah. States allows, you know, allows me the gift of bringing in an, another way of thinking to similar problems, right? Another way to appreciate things. And so it's, you know, it's not the only form of diversity, but it is a, it's a very important one when you're building a business and especially like my businesses I've built, um, I never believed in, um, expensive rent for offices. I believed in getting the talents globally, uh, all my businesses back 2015, always global started outsourcing 2008, eight, really, um, hundreds and hundreds of people I've worked with around the globe that this idea, this idea of thinking international, even before the business world yeah. really did. Right. Um, and then knowing how to work together with different cultures and different viewpoints and, and just genuinely loving people, it really helped. It really has helped our business. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've got my co-founders who, when we started, um, you know, they were a little skeptical, but I was the get it done guy, right? They were the operations and sales people. So they looked at me to, you know, not micromanage. They said, okay, this is why we partnered with you to get it done. I was like, this is how I want to get it done. And, you know, a little skeptical at first, like, can this really work? Can we have company culture when we're so distributed? I mean, we're asking these questions, you know, half a decade before COVID. Yeah. Uh, and making it a radical decision from the ground up that we're going to be distributed from day one. You know, there were not that high percentage of companies who were like that in 2015, 16. It, it took a very different approach. Yeah. So this is actually really interesting and, and resonates with me because I have an international team as well. I've not lots of countries, like India, Philippines, um, and not Europe yet. Although I know some people in Europe developers that I've worked with in the past. Um, but that's how I look at my agency as well. Like, you know, I'm building it, um, you know, it's an international team and, and business and company. And, yeah. and uh, while I, do hope to i'm in i'm in the u.s and i hope to uh be in a position to hire somebody in the u.s eventually build a little team core team here um i i, I think about it that way but do you what were the challenges behind that though like you um you know to like where does your team like you said you're diverse like how many different countries and and what were the challenges behind yeah. that building that type of team and, cult, and maintaining the culture it's more that. like where they are not where they are there's not. I, yeah <laughs> by now we got we got like between the businesses maybe like 70 people or so um but it's it's not so much from where they are it's who they are mm -hmm. um and You've got, you know, you can go on like um, a talent show with Simon Crowell, whatever, yeah. right? The, all those talent shows. Britain's got talent. And so. at, at some point, he might just see an audition and say, you've got that X factor. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right? The je ne sais quoi. Like, but usually it's not the hard skills that make the difference. It's the soft skills, 100%. I'll take great soft skills over hard, great hard skills every day, every day. Uh, you know, and, 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 and you know, it, it, it might take you, it might take you finding, you know, 20 people to keep one gem, but then you treat him well, you never let go. Mm. You make him family, yeah. right? And they join you to your next venture and your next venture because they couldn't imagine working for anyone else. Love that. You gotta, you gotta be kind, but you gotta give them opportunity to grow. 
um, there's a few rules, um, right? Number one, you have to provide stability. Stability means that they're not, you know, they're not scraping by financially. It doesn't have to mean you have to pay more than everyone else, but you have to, they have to have stability. They have to not, you have to make it where they do not think about money. Uh, so that means paying on time, never missing a payment, never asking them to work for free. Um, those are like basics, Basic stuff, yeah. but then you have to, you have to treat them so well and surround them with colleagues that they could never imagine leaving. Um, you have to give them opportunity for growth. One, one key thing I always had in my businesses and it's kind of unique to not unique as the, I'm the only business in the world who has it, but unique as in more rare to find. I like operating at the cutting edge of technology. Mm -hmm. Always have. Um, when we had our um, marketing agencies, SEO agencies, so I'm an, I'm an SEO expert, but I never really wanted an SEO company. I felt like, um, I felt like if you know how to do it, you do it for yourself, not for others. But that changes when you get a million dollar check. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. And um, I, I, I uh, even in the SEO business, things change all the time and you need to be at the cutting yeah. edge. So you create an environment where people don't have to think about money when they where they enjoy showing up for work where they feel challenged where they constantly learn new things i mean i mean you could go and make a few bucks more in the company next door but then have to deal with a diva of a manager who yells at you or or they may be the nicest people in the world but they're having you fill out spreadsheets all day long and you commit career yeah. suicide yeah right Versus you can work at a place where you can genuinely wake up and be excited about going to work, doing incredible things, writing an incredible story. And you have to like, this is a, like an, an overarching tip, but imagine your company is a story like Harry Potter or Star Wars or whatever you're into. <laughs> All um, of the above. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I was thinking about a more female friendly show but i can't think of any because i'm such a nerd <laughs> yeah <laughs> harry potter has i i my wife likes harry potter maybe <laughs> mine too let's let's just settle there okay. let's just settle there harry potter stop talking alexander stop talking <laughs> um stop while you're ahead um think of your business like you're writing that story if your team does not feel like they're part of a journey, a destination, they don't have a Voldemort, they're not hunting ho Horcruxes or whatever <laughs> they're called. If they're not part of that and they can't tell you what the mission is, what the values are that bond you together, you're doing something mm. wrong. You know, storytelling framework is not just to outside to get clients. You have to be a good storyteller internally as well. You have to be on a quest together. You know, a team that's on a quest to reach the top of the Himalayas, it is not gonna just fall apart. No. They have a shared mission no. and you have to communicate well and you have to communicate in a way that inspires people. I know not everyone has that skill um, naturally, but it can help when, th when, when you think about it a little bit and even the little bit communication you have helps you. I think that's what sets the companies I've been a part of apart. I think when we do employee surveys, surveys, it, they keep coming back to this. What do you love the most, right? And and it's not a hundred percent of responses, but many there's many different things people love. Mm -hmm. But a, a consistent theme that we see over and over is that. You know, the world is changing and that's true for AI and SEO and marketing and for whatever your job is right now. Let's be real. Your job is changing more than it has, I don't know, in the past decade. Yeah. In the next two years, it will change more than in the last 12 years. And you know it. 
and everybody's thinking, man, I got to go to school and what am I going to study that my job is still going to be relevant 10 years from now. And the professors themselves say, we don't really know for sure. And if we pretend to be sure, we're kind of bluffing or lying, yeah. right? Or just to make you feel better. Every AI person who hits that stage will have a, and will have a round of Q&A, will have this question. What does it mean for my job? What does it mean for my future? What does it mean for my children? We all have those questions. Mm -hmm. And whenever that question is asked, you know, there's a part of us that, you know, wants to inspire and show people where the future can head. And then there's this huge part of uncertainty, right? And so whenever we're telling the uncertainty part, we feel like we're we're doing a disservice to the world because we're not showing the other side of the coin. And whenever we're very optimistic, which feels like our duty, because you cannot, how do you put it? If Elon Musk were to disappear, abducted by UFOs, and the world would still continue on its electri electrification journey. Right. It's already been in, it's already in motion. Uh, you know, he has been instrumental in starting that motion, but now that the world is in motion, the world will continue in motion. And, and so the same thing is true for like all major innovations, reusable rockets. You only need to show it once, you know, the right, I, I, I don't remember going to the air a, airport and seeing something like Wright brother airlines, right? Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. It doesn't have to be yeah. that way. It's hard to start. It's hard to start something. It really is. But once things are in motion, they're in motion. And so all we can do with this technology and it's, a, you know, Jonathan Pajot, it's a bit of a philosopher, thinker online. It, he, he said something about AI, which I thought was fascinating from a philosophical point of view. It's kind of like, AI already has consciousness, but it's a consciousness like, uh, like in the movie, the mummy, when he was trying to reassemble his yeah. body from the great beyond. And there were these people who were helping him in assembling his body, whether it was good for them or not, that the mummy was resurrected or not. It, it was kind of in an inevitability. It was already in motion. Right? It was, yeah. Exactly. And so, when you're thinking about it, if, if you as human, if we as humans as a society, uh, you know, make the arrival of very smart AI an inevitability and we can't help but contribute to it, then in a way, the AI already has a consciousness and is already acting upon us. So it's in a very different spirit than I would, I would, I would now say something to you and I say, hey, Matt, do this. But instead, if I could create an environment where inevitably you, Matt, are going to contribute to the spreading of ideas of AI and therefore talk to other people and aspire to adoption of AI, which then creates the market for AI, which then creates the economical incentive to create AI, which then incentivizes researchers to get high paychecks and join companies that make AI and then makes incentives for the chip makers to go and make those chips that support those companies that are incentivized and uh, and then and then seeing the stock market shareholders see that those stocks are going up of such companies and start increasing the valuation of some companies then having other companies watch that happen and then pivot to ai so that their stock market can values uh, increase as well this is your butterfly effect yeah you yeah. you did that you flapped your wings and this podcast by talking about it yeah. right and so this is a type of consciousness in in this in this technology that's already around us and when you're on stage talking about ai or on podcasts like this right you you have to i think you have to talk about the potential of ai for good and the reason why, even even if it has a lot of potential for bad, the reason why is the same reason why if if they're talking about mass killers on the news, there will be more mass killers out there. 
if you talk about Nazis and all that stuff, there's going to be more people who pick up on it and become kind of so self fulfilling. What we talk about is kind of what we talk about. Yeah. I mean, this is well studied. Yeah, yeah. This is well studied. I'm not saying go and censor to other stuff because then it creates a certain of allure sure. to it as well. But do not do, do talk about the thing you want you want to put out there in the world because it it becomes like you said it becomes a way of of becoming true. And with AI, if it is true that it is somehow inevitable that it will happen, I think it is extremely important that we have the conversation about how we want to use it for good, how we want it to use it to eradicate hunger, homelessness, um, social injustices, and not just in this country, but globally, how we're going to make make people's life generally better. And I'm not talking about us all being glued to a screen like uh, social media has gotten us addicted with dopamine hits. I'm talking about generally improving hum the human condition. Um, and, and, and if we talk about it, then just like that example of what I gave, uh, you start talking about it, then that happens, that that happens, and that happens. It becomes like an idea like electric cars which the world cannot unsee. And even if Elon Musk or you or I stop having podcasts and disappear, adopted by, <clears throat> abducted by aliens, along with Elon having tea, uh, in one of those uh, <laughs> hidden exoplanets, um, it will be an idea that will become unstoppable if mm -hmm. we put enough behind it. And so this is why I think when we talk about artificial intelligence, it is extremely important that we do so in a way that can inspire the best outcome. So I, I want to kind of wrap that back into, and then we're, we want to wrap that back into what we uh, were talking about in term, terms of teams. I think that like in our company and, and it, it's on us to, talk about in, in a positive way AI and how we can use those tools, how we can use it in our business to help our clients, to help the world uh, through our services or products or whatever we're doing, that it's actually going to help us do that. And it's going to also build that momentum. And so that if we get, you know, abducted and our team is still here though, they're still, and they're spreading the word and they're spreading the, you know, um, cause I, I try to, I talk to my team about that all the time. I was obviously being web developers and designers and it, it affects us, uh, dramatically. And I have a very positive outlook about it though. And I, I think a lot about that because I think about, you know, in five years, where's my business going to be, you know, and, and I see it in a very positive light. I see it as, as magnifying what we're able to do, capable of doing and, um, that we may not even need as large a team. We may need a smaller team and we're going to have, uh, agents helping us <laughs> accomplish things. Um, but, you know, so I, I think, I think you're right. I think a lot of, uh, you know, talking about it is really, really important and not just focusing on the bad. Cause I, I, one of the, I mean, I have a, a ton of things, <laughs> angles I could come at here with you. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about talking about today with you is, is just uh, what, why are some companies, why are some people, companies afraid of adopting AI or why, why are they hesitating and, or what do they need to know that, uh, you know, that they need to start looking at this and considering it. Um, there's, there's a lot of questions in there, you know, how can, cause it's going to have an impact on your business, whether you want to or want it to or not, you're not going to fight it. It's coming. Right. I mean, um, I gotta be careful with these things. So I'm going to make a disclaimer because, I read it somewhere doesn't mean it's true, but even if it's not true, uh, it makes for a very good story <laughs> and it makes sense. So I'm going to say it anyway. Um, I read somewhere that when the printing press was kind of like invented in, in Europe, um, the Ottoman Empire, whatever the title of the Sultan or whatever ruler name was, um, was advice that it could be used to create propaganda that would challenge his rule, mm. something like yeah. that. And 
he decided to ban the printing press from his empire as such. Um, again, something I read, I don't know if it's is true. Um, go look it up. It, it sounds like it might be true. <laughs> it sounds um, like yeah. but, and, um, and then according to what I read, um, you know, the, while Europe was starting to spread information, accelerated the sharing of information, it means the societies were thriving. Whereas the, in the Ottoman Empire, you know, eventually had its decline. Mm -hmm. And they had to reverse the decision of banning the printing press uh, at some point. But by that time, it already had sustained so much damage and that Ottoman Empire collapsed. Now, I'm sure nothing in geopolitics is ever that simple, but it, I, I do believe that it, if this story is true, I believe it could be a contributing factor. But truth is not always a materialistic truth. It, it sometimes is also a moral truth. That's why you can say the story of Pinocchio is true. Even if you didn't believe there was a little wooden boy well, that talked, that, you know, but Pinocchio is true. Red Riding Hood is true. These are true stories. So if the, if the core of the lesson of a story is true, you can tell a story is true because we've been conditioned to accept only the mat materialistic version of truth in this society and as part of where we're in the mess that we are. We, we lost our collective imagination, so mm -hmm. to speak. Now, that said, um, imagine you are a business today and... AI is your printing press. If you hold back the innovation and technology, you, your competi and your competitors do not, it can be the downfall of your empire. It's mm. a good way to look at it. Think about it in yeah. those terms. Yeah. Uh, because this is, this is the best way I can see it. Companies that are bloated, bureaucratic, People care more about their paycheck and their cushy position and job. Those companies will not exist 10, 15 years from now. They will be replaced 100%, right? In the same way that SpaceX is replacing NASA rocket building. Right. It makes no sense for that bureaucracy to continue to build rockets that are billions of dollars over budget that are super expensive to launch and then are retired like a few years later mm -hmm. because they didn't meet the market yeah. demands. When you as a company, on the other hand, embrace the printing press of today, AI, you mean you can do things that others could not have dreamed mm -hmm. of accomplishing. This is the framework by which you need to think about it. Uh, choosing to not adopt completely, completely this new technology as a business in every department, training every single one of your people is planned obsolescence. You're already deciding that you're going to let your business slowly die. There is no other way. And again, this is something that is a force beyond what you or I control. Yeah. This is happening. And so you have to think about yeah, if this is true, that this is happening, then, you know, use it for good. Don't use it to cut team members <clears throat> who want to be part of the story. Use it to elevate them and 10x your competition and make them obsolescent, obsolete. Um, use it for good. That's what I'd say. But if you choose not to use it, I mean, that's your right. But you just might be like the Ottoman Empire, right? Right. Yeah, and I um, and I and I think when I said that, you know, like five years from now, I see myself maybe a smaller team. Maybe it's the same team. It's just we're doing a lot more, and each of them is doing so much more out there. Right. Uh, so we don't have to continue growing and adding and adding and adding. But yeah, it, it's. I mean, maybe maybe you can teach some of your staff to just build powerpoints for fifteen years. <laughs> See how that's gonna go, <laughs> right? Yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and, and I mean, every business is different how they'll implement it. I mean, what? So one of the things, and 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 then I want to talk a little bit about you know what you do specifically. But one of the things um, uh, that I'm thinking about in my business, right, as an agency, 
um, you know, we're doing really, really well. Like, like I don't even have any signs that AI's taken over yet. You know, like we're still doing great. We're growing. Um, and although AI is definitely always in the conversation, even with clients, um, is what are the first steps? Like, I'm thinking about like from my perspective now. Now this is just like, you know, we can talk a little bit about what you do and, and what you're building. Um, but how do I prepare like my data? Let's say I want all my data to be in a database somewhere. Like I was looking into this actually. I'm like, there's different kinds of databases. There's some that I can put all our stuff into a certain type of database so that other like AI can actually use that eventually. Is that even where I start? You know, where, what do I, where do I start? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, fun, fun, funny you mentioned that. But um, I made the move this year to go to network attached storage. Okay. And start recording and logging and storing as much of my conversations and as possible. Mm. Um, my meetings are recorded. Um, I even record sometimes with permission, right? personal interactions one day AI will be able to sort and filter and organize all those files for you not today not really you know people say but you still need to write code to really do it properly right, right. and you still need to edit and so forth that it's okay you can be lazy it's like uh, it's like when my grandfather was taking pictures in the 60s or whatnot with his first camera he he couldn't conceive that I would have taken a picture with a cell phone from 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 his actual physical yeah, picture that's cool. yeah. long after he died yeah. on a device he could have not imagined yeah. at that time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's now digital. And then I share it in a team channel with someone of my team and say like, hey, look, this is my grandfather when he was going out and about. You cannot imagine the technology that will be around 10 years, 20 years from now. You can't imagine it. But... If you don't have the data, you don't have to imagine it. There will not be a picture to take uh, to take with your cell phone. Right. There won't there won't be something to take. So go and take that. Even if it's low resolution, who cares? You know, image upscalers are a thing now, right? Yeah, right. You can feed this right. ancient picture in into pixels. a recon. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I can now have my. I was thinking about this honestly for like a YouTube channel. Take like old pictures and apply those dance transformation TikTok things to. So you can have like um, <laughs> Albert Einstein doing TikTok <laughs> dances and like different historical figures. Right, right. Right? <laughs> it could be a thing. Yeah. Um, could be a thing. Reanimate your um, past, yeah. But they could have never imagined yeah. that. That's the point. So, yeah, for sure. Um, we got to start being data hoarders right now. Um, and. Yeah. Ultimately, you know how Superman goes to the Fortress of Solitude to go and talk to his, yes. like, um, you know, and, and that person's no longer in existence, apparently, right? But there's still a memory bank mm -hmm. that he could access and have a conversation with. You know, I want to gift that to, if I were to pass tomorrow, I want that to be available for my team so they're not left without my well, help. Imagine Man, I want that right, to that's be... one of the things, right? So, like, if all this stuff, all your thoughts, all your ideas, all this stuff, if you get it down into some form, some database, something out there, one day you might not be at the company anymore for whatever reason. And, right. But somebody can have a conversation with you. What would Matt do? Well, they can, uh, they can, <laughs> cool they can rent my digital likeness. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it will happen, Matt. Yeah. It will yeah. happen, like sites like Upwork and Fiverr, you know, I put it a little bit in hyperbole here. It will, it will happen like 80%, like I say, and then 20%, it will change and transform in unexpected mm. ways. But sites like Upwork and Fiverr are going away and AI agents are going to take its place. So imagine that you can have Tony Robbins come help you with your marketing campaign. Wouldn't you want Tony <laughs> Robbins agent over some random person? Yeah, so, you, so you're saying like country? people are going to be creating these these agents these, that basically represent somebody or something, and exactly. they can, they can and themselves use those. It's a whole. There's no business like AI business, yeah, right? <laughs> it, wow. It, it's it's going to be like your agency even and your agency services. 
if you are respected, um, people can just engage with agent version of your of your business while you're <clears throat> on a beach somewhere having virgin pina colada. <laughs> um, I love this. This is good. It, it, yeah. We're going to have our alter egos and those are going to be economically producing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then people are going to just go to a marketplace of the greats. You're going to be able to have, I mean, you can have a company with, <clears throat> you know, you can have a, you know, a Steve Jobs and Joni Ive agent working in your company. Oh my gosh. Imagine. So <laughs> you can have Joni Ive agent. Would you like not yeah, use that? Might. I would. You might. <laughs> right. You'd be smart. Um, yeah, but you put you know, right, your so own team then, together. Like this is in, in that, it could still come exactly. out differently. But based on what you listen to and what you the so questions the GPT you ask. store, the co-pilot agents, all of that—that's the beginning of a new form of app store, mm -hmm. right? You can think of them as agent stores. The I think the internet is the ultimate agent store. So this is the meaning of the executable web, Web three. Um, every brand becomes a brand agent because that brand agent, that website is, uh, you know, you can talk to the brand agent in the metaverse and have a conversation about why I should buy your product or they can show you around or you can be on the website and they can have a conversation yeah. with you. They can show you around. They can answer your question. I mean, the days of browsing web pages with navigation bars and hamburger menus, please. <laughs> what is this? The 80s? Like, it's like it, this is like right. computers before a mouse. Yes. What are you talking yes. about? This is going away. Yeah. Right? We're going to have this interactive web and websites are just going to become um, either, if, as if it's a SaaS company, the agent that represents that domain can do your taxes or it can it can make pictures or it can make flyers or it can plan parties and whatever so it defining, is. So defining an and, agent is, an agent is uh, basically a, an AI that does a specific or is, is has a specific personality or co or programming or um, purpose is that what an agent is yeah so so agent agency agent agency what is it like to have agency if i took you matt and i would took take your brain and put it in a jar and keep it alive and I, I could create a series of inputs and outputs for you, digital. Like you can speak and your words can appear on a screen for me and I can type something in and it goes back to your brain and you can understand it and answer back, right? That's, that's AI today. It has no agency. Mm. You got to give it arms, legs, ability to do gotcha, stuff. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So use the internet. You browse the web, use tools, make purchases, and yes, one day, upload it in an Optimus <laughs> robot from Tesla. <laughs> one day, right. right? But agency is really important in order to give economic value. So let's say that you had know everything about carpentry, but you do not have agency to use a hammer. You can't use tools. How much can you really get done? You talk about agents, the moment that you combine AI with tooling, with ability to execute and do stuff. And that happens when AI, it's already happening. Uh, this is what I'm building yes. with SmithOS. It's an agent building framework. What you do is you grab the different AI, uh, drag and drop, you add your data, drag and drop, you add your APIs, your tools, drag and drop. You connect them with lines and say, this is what you're allowed to do. And all of a sudden, you you know, you create an agent that can, you know, communicate between your database, email, and LinkedIn posts. And it's your workflow. Mm -hmm. And we're building sales agents to help researcher competitors. We're building SEO agents that can build... Uh, amazing competitive articles we're we're, bu we're building agents that help our engineering team it's called sentinel um by connecting github or knowledge base and our uh, our ticket system and um and then we use different ai models uh that some of them can code some of them can do security checks and 
and the agents work with the human counterparts as colleagues. And you deploy them to your site, to Discord, to ChatGPT. But you can also deploy them as an API in the server, as a background process. Like they can do all the number crunching so, so that when you wake up and use login to your regular system, everything's already there. Uh, create a new uh, Jira ticket or Asana ticket, uh, say like new client, right? Need to do SEO research for these things. And then next thing you know, that ticket was read by an agent. Ha the agent did the preliminary research, pulled in all the files and attached it to the ticket. You never had to speak to it, but it was always there working for you. And whenever it creates a ticket, it finds out who to delegate it to, which agent or human. And it could do that. Or you can build agents that uh, make phone calls to customers to check in how they're doing. I mean, great. Um, or not great, <laughs> depending how you use it. But age, uh, what Smith OS is, Smith with a Y, OS stands for operating system. We provide two core services. A way to run agents, scale, secure, encryption, all of that, out of the box. And then a way to build agents drag and drop and deploy it to that so service that's that runs it no for code. you so with with smith we are currently in the process to completely completely re-architect how business is done and when i was talking about like 2015 making a fully remote company i am among the first in the world today to to make my entire business full of ai colleagues so not just remote offshore blended, but remote offshore blended with AI colleagues. <laughs> I love that. That's the next yeah. step. By the end of 2024, every department, maybe every colleague, uh, every person in the team is going to have AI agent or plural in their department, helping them offload their job. Yes. Parts of it. I love that. So humans are going to work in blended teams with AI colleagues who work with each other and work with humans and know how to escalate things to humans. But there will always still be my team in the right. loop. They will just be able to do 10 times right. more. Our marketing team, 10x. Our sales team, 10x. Our RFP process, 10x. Our customer reporting for client satisfaction, 10x. Our, um, our project management, uh, and m tracking of employee allocation, happiness, 10x, HR, 10x, financial reporting and due diligence, 10x, tax preparation, 10x, uh, or, um, or SEO researchers, 10x, or writers, 10x, or editors, 10x, or developers, 10x, everything, 10x. Um, and then why not 100x <laughs> after that? Because once you have 10. it up and running, you can scale. And so... But, you know, the next 10 years, we're going to have a trillion dollar company run by three people. Yeah. And it will be them and a thousand Smith agents. I love that. I love that. Well, even today, like what, like with my team, um, like I have a VA that helps me with this, the podcast, and, and does she does all the clips and, and distributes it and does all that stuff. Um, and But creating the content for it, I've actually, you know, I've, you know the new chat GPT, uh, the G custom GPTs. Uh, created a yes. little a bot for her to be able to drop in this and that and, and it, it creates like but it's programmed by me like it's my brain like I, I trained it and now she can just use it yeah. but you know I'm imagining you know in, in, in that's kind of a maybe a basic agent uh, but you could deploy Smith agents to GPTs yeah so if you want something more advanced than a chat bot with an instruction and a document attached to it but actually give it agency, give, given it your workflow, given it all your data and all its complexities, like SQL, yeah. uh, connecting to various AIs that collaborate together to achieve, to achieve different outcomes. What if you wanted to make like a, an agent that can scan x-rays and help with radiology, right? With Smith, you can hook up those AI models into an agent and then hook that up into, G, into a GPT. Right, or if you wanted to control your logistics, like one of the cool things I imagine is gonna is is possible, is let's say you have a warehouse and your database says something is in stock, 
but um, you want to you want to have a system that verifies it. You can dispatch a drone to that location in your warehouse, take a picture, then use a vision model to see if that stuff is really there, and then update the database. Incredible. Like you can do that today with Smith OS. Wow, wow. So you're and we're going kind of long here. I hope you don't. If you got somewhere to go, let me know. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. It's the last. It's the it's the last weeks of the yeah. year, so uh, things are a little okay. quiet now. And okay, um, I I took actually this time of the of the of the year to catch up on some of the podcast quota that I didn't gotcha. hit because I was so busy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, good. Yeah, you were a little busy, aren't you? Yeah, what would you say? Like you did busy. like forty three podcasts this year or something, you know, something along those lines. Yeah. Anyway, um, no, so um, so you're you're focused on, if I remember right, uh, enterprise right now, right? It's that's that's kind of your like who's your ideal client or person to, to use your systems? Yeah. So there's two. First of all, first of all. Even though our technology is super cool, we're still a startup. Mm -hmm. And as a startup, you can build, do all the right things, but if you don't focus, you can go nowhere. Right. And for us, we need to focus on what is the biggest reward for our time and attention, right? The best place and the most value we can create with agents today is for companies who already have processes that are extremely valuable because of how bloated they are. So the more bloated you are, the bigger your company is, the bigger your problems are, the more value you're going to get out of agents economically, like right away. You, I mean, there's companies that can save hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars solving bottlenecks, right? So we want to start out with with solving those problems although my kids have asked me to help them make a homework agent <laughs> i think <laughs> the economic value is not quite uh, the same right now love it um so i instead just gave him smith os and told them to go build their own agent <laughs> which they are doing. aren't they lucky um, aren't they lucky to have a father but, that's <laughs> well uh, that's or not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or i just need to give him a bicycle in a medieval mm. town to um yeah. oh. but um the, the the clients we're focused on are either enterprise who have tremendous inefficiencies or obstacles to overcome that agents can now solve for the first time ever and create incredible value for both them and us. Then the second group of clients that we focus on as our initial customer profile would be agencies see when an agency has access to something like Smith like a, just a quick example we built an account based marketing agent um, that can do competitive research create a personalized outreach video with our face our voice uh, can then write email copy create landing pages create LinkedIn copy create sign up pages with uh, calendar and everything and then saves our salespeople like three days of research, just like in minutes. Well, I put the scope of work on Upwork to see how much it would cost to build that. It took me, it took me like a day to build and a day to refine. Upwork came back and said $50,000 <laughs> all the way to 150000 and at least three months. Median was like five months to build it. All right, if you're an agency and your competitors have to pay $50,000 on Upwork and, and, and three, four, five months to get it done, but you have Smith OS and you can do it in days, faster, better, more affordable, it means you're putting your competition out of business in quotes. Right. You, you're, you can make millions of dollars, right? So. Not only that, but you can use our technology to do the same thing I do with my business and transform your entire business from the ground up. Every department, you can build your own agents internally. Certain agencies are really, really eager for that. 
And so um, once they have the ability to close more deals and, and win more business, paying for Smith, it's, it's so low cost compared to what they can make. It makes total sense. Uh, the key thing is, do they have people in their team who are willing to learn to become good agent builders? Right, and because it, it requires some investment of time to become a good agent builder, even with a platform as Smith that is so easy compared to the alternative, you still need like a good two three weeks of hands on before you get really good. Um, you don't necessarily need to be a genius coder. I have someone who I hired years ago as a content writer, who who just built an entire marketing agent in her own time. Didn't even have to tell her how to do, it. and she has no coding background and it can do calendar bookings appointment linkedin posting discord posting uh seo article writing it can read at google analytics and make reports it, i mean she built all of that in her free time without a coding background so it is a whole new frontier uh, it's kind of like oh you're a coder great but do you know how to code an assembly <laughs> if you don't are you really a coder <laughs> right but the same thing is like if she can build agents with sure. Smith without needing to know all that the low, low, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, underlying architecture and co code, is she really an agent builder? <laughs> yeah, yes, she absolutely. is. Just move on with the times. <laughs> Technology has moved on. That's right. Does it benefit you from knowing how to code an assembly and make more efficient C code? Yes, it probably does. Is it necessary to produce economic value? No, I'm sorry. I'm sure there's a niche job out there for you, but other people can do this yep. too now. I'm sorry, your monopoly is yep. broken. So we're focusing on clients that either have large problems at enterprise who can afford uh, to solve those problems. And then we partner with agencies to execute that work. And we are a platform company. So for medium companies, uh, we do have... We do have like a startup scholarship type of deal. Let's say someone comes to us and says, I, I, I have a proven track record of working in the AI field, talking about it, or I got like a large social media following um, and people listen to me. And I think this technology is revolutionary. I am sure that, that if you give me access, like for a few months, I'm sure that I can create so much economic value for myself that I will become one of your customers, right? That's where scholarship mm. comes in. And part of the scholarship idea is also like glo global equity because this technology is so disruptive. People from other countries might fall behind unless we give them a chance to level the playing field, give them an opportunity. And so the scholarship exists for that purpose too. So those are our main clients right now. And people may say, well, like, you know, why not open it to everyone? We have done a mass market product before and the technology was like single-handedly responsible to grow certain enterprise clients traffic by 10 million visitors per month, per month, not per year, per month, 10 million. That's a lot. Okay. There's a lot of people talking about, oh, I'm so good at SEO, and then they show their growth chart, and you see it goes from 200 to 2,000. Well, you looked at mine. <laughs> I mean, try to go to, two, try to, go to 10 million, yeah, yeah, all right? Yeah. It's like, yeah, I mean, and then they think they invented certain things like semantic optimization, which I built an AI before you even had a LinkedIn channel that did semantic optimization. But sure, you got to do your marketing. <laughs> some, people, some people are more busy talking, other people are more yeah, busy yeah. doing. That's okay. Yeah. Because I know you get money from doing, not from just talking about it. Right. Indirectly, it helps. That's why I'm on podcasts. Um, but it's it's um, it's a very quickly changing world, and I think that people who who have the eagerness to explore and try new things, um, people that are are using GPT before you even told them to you use it. People that are building new and cool prompts and tell their colleagues, hey, try this, this can help you. That right there is a sign that you got a gem. Uh, those are the people that are going to thrive in this next decade.
right? It's not it's not that prompt engineering itself is is makes them valuable. No, you could have forced them through a course where they had to learn it and they know it. That's not valuable. What is valuable is like what is that intellectual curiosity, soft skill, spark that made them want to learn that. We find that those are the best people to also become agent engineers, the people that have that soft skill. So if people are are like, I have such a person or more in my team who have that spark, uh, maybe a little bit of background in development can help, of course, then those people can transform their business from within and agencies and businesses can win RFPs and win projects that take it to the next level. Every other business out there, everyone else is going to fall behind at first, but then the agent marketplaces are going to start becoming a thing. And then on a secondary level, not everybody needs to build an app for the iPhone. Maybe it's just a matter of using an app that's already there in a very efficient mm -hmm. way. So once the marketplaces are there, I think the the, the mid-sized companies and, 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 and startups are going to start getting access to so much productivity through agent marketplaces. Now granted, you know, you and I are going to be on the beach sharing a piña colada while other people use our agents to make money. <laughs> so it, it pays off. <laughs> yeah. To be the agent yes, builder, yes, you know what I gotcha, mean. Yes. But for the for the smaller companies, there will be also a great explosion of productivity once this market. Yeah. Because again, we're like imagine having Johnny Ive be our designer and Tony Robbins yeah. come help your team, and 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 so forth. Right? It, it's like the that website masterclass or yeah. something. But instead of just talking about it, they get in your business right. and help you, can, you with all their yeah, skill. Yeah. Imagine that. Just does the work. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Love it. Well, fractional agent CMO. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I need one of those. Um, this no, this is a fantastic. You know, we could talk all day about this stuff, uh, but and hopefully, I would love to have you back again someday uh, to dig into more of this um, or to just track your progress. Because well, I share so much story. We're like basically audience. <laughs> We're like basically family I now. I feel like I know you so well now. <laughs> Um, no, so, right. okay, so if somebody, now you mentioned your website, uh, smithos.com, and yes. where else do you hang out? Where can people get in touch with you, uh, find out more about you, learn about you? LinkedIn and Twitter, uh, my handle is A-D-R-I-D-D-E-R, A-D Ritter, um, and um, yeah, find me there, mostly, I mean, I'm not... I'm not on Instagram uh, anymore. Uh, that site got too polluted. Yeah. Um, Facebook is so watered yeah. down; they don't give you reach anymore. We have a we have a Facebook group. Um, if you want, to, here's one thing I'll tell you: if you want to be part of our Discord group with agent engineers, we have a we have a group for that, and it could be interesting. So if you want to be part of that. Uh, send me a message on social media and I'll send you the invite link. Um, yeah, I, I mean, people are doing unbelievable stuff with this. It's exciting. Um, and I'm not just talking about like 30 person agencies. I'm talking about we're working with agencies that have 1,200 developers and they're throwing like 20 engineers at, at once to be reskilled and learn this. World is, like world is changing quick. This. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting so, stuff. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, appreciate you sharing your story and uh, what you're doing and all your, your knowledge around AI. You got me more excited. I know that. Until next time. Thank you. That's all for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed that. Again, please subscribe if you haven't already and give us a thumbs up if we deserve it. If you want to comment on this episode's page, provide me with requests on topics for future episodes, or inquire about being a guest, please find your way to thebuilders.fm. You can contact me there or add a comment under these show notes. Now a word from our sponsor, my agency, Unified Web Design. 
We build custom websites, features, we maintain websites, we work with agencies to fulfill their web design and development needs, and more. If you are interested in our services or are looking for an agency to work with as a partner to build awesome sites for your clients, feel free to reach out to me at unifiedwebdesign.com. There's a handy contact me link at the top. Fill out that form and it will open a ticket and that ticket will find its way to me. Thanks for joining me today. We'll see you next time.